Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. There was actually too much going on this week. You had announcements made at Hot Chips and Gamescom, revealing reports on shady dealings with SSD internals and the right way and the wrong way to handle a hardware recall. And the steadily increasing flow of leaks, rumors, and other tantalizing product details that can only mean we're hurtling at breakneck speed towards the holiday season when people buy more things so manufacturers will be producing more things for people to buy. I'm going to steadily increase the flow of beer into this glass Last though, available at paulshardware.net. Oh, that's a big, that's a big foamy. Oop. Not the best pour of my life, but this beer is called the end of the world. But then I will redirect that flow into my mouth. Cheers. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Corsair's IQ7000 series premium full tower cases with two versions available, the Airflow Optimized 7000D and the Stylish 7000X RGB, available in white or black. There's plenty of room for epic water cooling setups with support for dual 420 millimeter radiators or triple 360s, as well as convenient features for building like hinged removable panels, flexible storage options for hard drives or SSDs, and rapid route cable management guides. For more on Corsair's IQ7000 series, click the sponsor link in the description. We begin today with a computer and a contact lens that can put an augmented reality display right onto your eyeball. Startup Mojo Vision detailed their progress on the lenses at Hot Chips this week, and the tech certainly seems straight out of a sci-fi movie. A contact lens is small and thin, but somehow they're fitting multiple components onto one. A hexagonal display at the center, less than half a millimeter wide with greenish pixels that are one quarter the width of a red blood cell, and a tiny magnification system to expand the image and project it onto the center of your retina. A camera, in this case an ultra low power CMOS sensor with a 256 by 256 resolution, at 44 frames per second that only draws 61 microwatts of power. That records what you're seeing. A motion sensor to track your eye movement and shift the display output accordingly. A wireless SOC with Wi-Fi and an ARM Cortex MCU to process images, control the display and communicate with a smartphone or similar device. A power management IC and of course, a battery with wireless charging capabilities. Right now, test units are almost working. Very, very close, according to Mojo Vision CTO, Mike Weimer, with a one hour battery life that they're hoping to extend to two while in full operation. Since AR use cases are more sporadic though, their goal for shipping products is that you'd have the lens on your eye all day with regular use and then just recharge it overnight like you would with your cell phone. The lens doesn't impact your vision otherwise though, and while there's still no word on a launch date or price, it's 99% less likely to freak people out in social situations like Google Glass did because people don't like you recording them or pulling up their personal history during a casual conversation. Now they just won't know you're doing that stuff at all. Plus, you can brag that your eyeballs have Wi-Fi. The Geekbench database has once again revealed apparent performance numbers of an unreleased processor. In this case, the upcoming Intel Core i9-12900K, Team Blue's flagship Alder Lake CPU with eight performance cores and eight efficiency cores and 24 threads, since the efficient cores don't have hyper-threading. Am I gonna have to say that every time I discuss this thing? Way to make me miss the Skylake days when I could just say, it's an Intel quad core. Anyway though, the results in question paired the 12900K with 4800 speed DDR5 memory and it scored 1893 in the single core tests and 17299 in the multi-threaded ones. If true, that would be a 12% faster single thread score versus AMD's current best CPU, the 16 core 32 thread Ryzen 9 5950X and 3% faster for multi-threaded workloads, which is impressive given AMD's thread count advantage. It would also be 2% and 57% faster for single and multi threaded tests than Intel's current best 11900K CPU. Sounds like Intel might be putting up a fight this time around, but we'll hopefully find out for sure in a few months when Alder Lake launches. Meanwhile, Bench Leaks over on Twitter spotted a couple unique systems connected to the Milky Way at Home Network, a distributed computing platform working on a highly accurate three-dimensional model of the Milky Way galaxy. Stellar. They appear to be powered by Zen 3 based Threadripper Pro CPUs, the 5995WX with 64 cores and the 5945WX with 12 cores. This agrees with info previously revealed by the already infamous Gigabyte hack, which showed Threadripper and Threadripper Pro CPUs codenamed Chagall would sport up to 64 cores, a 280 watt max TDP, and thankfully continued socket TRX40 and TRX80 compatibility, which hopefully means they'll work with existing motherboards. Non-Pro models 
will have quad-channel DDR4 memory support and 64 PCI Express 4.0 lanes, and Pro versions like the 5995WX will bump up to 8-channel memory and 128 PCIe lanes. The Threadripper 5000 series is rumored to launch in November. NVIDIA has an RTX 3090 Super in the works, and it might even launch in 2021, at least if serial Twitter leakers Copite 7 Kimi and Greymon 55 are to be believed. On Wednesday, they both hinted at a full-fat GA102-based card, the GPU being the GA102-350-A1, with all 10,752 CUDA cores, a stat matched only by NVIDIA's Enterprise-class cards, the A40 and the RTX A6000. The RTX 3090 non Super, which is stupid and crappy now, and you should be embarrassed if you have one, has only 10,496 CUDA cores. <laughs> Pitiful. If that's not enough to convince you to ditch your 3090 non-super, which you probably paid two or three grand for, so it kind of sucks you have to call it non-super now, for a 3090 super, which will definitely cost at least a lot more money than that, then also consider that the 24 gigabytes of GDDR6X memory might bump up from 19.5 gigabits per second to 20 or even 21 gigabits per second, hitting one terabyte per second total, and hopefully also not running hotter than the molten core of an exploding gigabyte power supply, since Nvidia should have had time to fix that issue by now. We're also probably looking at higher clock speeds thanks to a board power of 400 to 450 watts. And if you want my opinion, yeah, this definitely seems very Nvidia to me. They don't have much cause to launch any new GPUs right now, but they don't want to sit out the whole holiday launch season either. So they drop a new fastest gaming graphics card in the world that gets 5% higher frame rates and gets our attention for a bit, even if it's just to say, Ew, those top-end NVIDIA cards are so stupid and expensive, while a handful of the wealthiest gamers buy them up because of all the things I said before. Just why super NVIDIA? Why not 3090 Ti? Is it because of all the 3080 Ti jokes? The GeForce RTX 3080 Ti it was probably because of all the 3080 tie jokes. My final story before we get to the short ones is sad and disheartening. It seems that SSD makers simply can't be trusted because we are hearing yet again of companies deceiving customers by swapping out internal components to save themselves a buck at the expense of performance, particularly egregious because the changes happen months or more after reviews of the unit are out. First, we have Western Digital, who switched the NAND in their popular budget WD Blue SN550 SSD, which happens to lower write speeds by up to 50% after the drive's cache is saturated. WD contacted Ars Technica after they posted this article and said they wouldn't do that anymore, and they'll introduce a new model number when they change stuff in the future. Maybe WD should have just done that in the first place. Next is Crucial, who downgraded their P2 NVMe SSD's TLC, or 3 bits per cell NAND flash, to QLC, 4 bits per cell, which is notably less expensive while also being slower and less durable. They didn't bother to change the name, of course. They simply claim that they listed QLC-based performance on the spec sheet from the get-go. Never mind how many reviews were posted with the faster TLC variant before they made the switch. Again, Crucial attempted to mask the downgrade with an increased cache size that resulted in similar performance in light workloads, but when tested fully, Sean from Tom's said the QLC version of the drive performs at roughly one quarter the speed of the original when transferring files, read speeds are half as fast in real-world tests, and sustained write speeds have dropped to USB 2.0-like levels of a mere 40 megabytes per second on an NVMe SSD. That's slower than most hard drives. And like I said, this has happened before. Adata's XPG SG8200 Pro shenanigans were probably the most recent, but every time I talk about it, people comment, just get a Samsung SSD. They cost more, but it's worth it. Well, guess what, Samsungites? Samsung is swapping SSD parts, too. On a good drive, too, the 970 EVO Plus, where Samsung has swapped the original Phoenix controller with their Elpis chip, which is technically an upgrade since that's what the 980 Pro uses. Performance results are mixed in testing, however, with improvements in some tests and regression in others. But notably, once again, write speeds drop significantly after the drive's SLC cache is used up. The OG drive hit 1500 megabytes per second in this situation, but the new drive dips to 800 megabytes per second, 47% slower. 
Samsung has at least updated the part number on the drive itself, and the packaging is also slightly different for the new version, but the 970 EVO Plus model name remains the same on both drives. The similarities here are no coincidence, though. These drives all hide their weaker performance behind some amount of RAM or SLC cache that performs just fine under light testing. It's only under heavy use, like transferring hundreds of gigabytes of video files, that the differences come to light. Samsung, WD, ADATA, Crucial, Patriot, and other Others who have made these moves with their products were just hoping we didn't notice. Which sucks, because it hurts our trust in them. And all they needed to do was list their new parts with new components inside as new products, because that's what they are. It's time for Tech Briefs. There's a lot to cover today, so Tech Briefs will be even tech briefier. First, Hisense's 8K TV has been spotted in an Amazon listing. You may be able to drop just shy of three grand for this 75-inch behemoth soon, which features a 120 hertz refresh rate, 7680 by 4320 resolution, 1000 nits peak brightness, and 180 zone local dimming. A built-in upscaler too, thankfully, since there are literally zero consumer video sources that can output 8K resolution right now. TSMC is raising prices by about 10% for their seven nanometer products and 20% for 16 nanometer and above, meaning CPUs, GPUs, SOCs, and more built on these nodes will get more expensive, and that sucks. Not for TSMC, of course. They are probably looking at a billion dollar revenue increase because of this move, and they're supposedly investing that money in new fabs, which could help smooth out the supply shortage in the long run. I'm, but I'm just sick of prices going up for everything. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it now! Speaking of things I'm sick of, Razer is rushing to fix a security vulnerability disclosed by security researcher John Hatt. Just plug in a Razer peripheral like a mouse, and you can hijack the Razer installer's admin privileges to execute PowerShell commands. Did Razer take immediate action to fix this when John Hatt informed them about it? No, they ignored him and only bothered with it when John Hatt went public with the flaw last weekend and tech sites started publishing articles about it. So hats off to you, John. You reminded Razer that they are committed to ensuring the digital safety and security of all our systems and services. But damn it, why must it always go down this way? Is no company capable of fixing their shit without widespread public shaming? But wait, is, is that, is that fractal? Oh my gosh our beacon of hope. Fractal launched their torrent case last week to rave reviews like Dimitri's from uh, Hardware Canucks, thanks to a unique design and airflow that is actually good. But they have stopped sales now due to a flaw in the integrated fan hub that they discovered. Note, they discovered it, they actively disclosed it, and they are providing replacement hubs or return service for customers who already bought the new case. I know we shouldn't give too much credit to someone for just doing what they're supposed to do, but given how the rest of the industry has been behaving of late, this is refreshing. Good form, fractal. Speaking of doing the right thing, Newegg has finally reached out to customers who were sold Gigabyte P-Series power supplies whether they wanted one or not. You know, the ones that were forced into GPU combos that also explode, but at least Newegg is now letting customers know about the situation if they weren't aware, and offering them refund or replacement service if they would prefer their computer not self-destruct in an indeterminate point in the future. Thanks for doing the bare minimum after trying for so long to shuck these PSUs off on unsuspecting customers, Newegg. Speaking of poor decision-making, Chinese company Baroch, Baroch, realized recently that the best place for a high pixel density 1440 by 1440 display is probably on top of your CPU. And they have an upcoming water block that will make their vision a reality. It's got a 2.9 inch 702 PPI display front and center. That's better pixel density than most smartphones. And it even has an HDMI input so you can use it as a second monitor. Likely use will be to display system stats or video animations for aesthetic reasons, but hey, you might as well game on it too. No word on FreeSync support. Finally, Microsoft has concluded their testing of Intel 7th generation and AMD Zen 1 CPUs to see if they meet their requirements for a Windows 11 upgrade and found that Ryzen 1000 CPUs do not, and only a handful of 7th gen Intel chips will make the cut too. That means no in-place upgrades for people using that hardware or older, 
but thankfully this is more due to driver support and security requirements than those CPUs just not having the processing power to run the new OS. You'll still be able to run Windows 11 with a Ryzen 1800X for example, but you'll need to do a clean install from a Windows 11 ISO rather than an upgrade of your existing operating system. Clean installs are way better anyway in my opinion. I say embrace minimalism and leave the trappings of your old OS behind. Then you too can make the joke about your Windows going to 11. So there you have it guys, tech news for the strong and the weak, for everyone really. But before I go, your feedback is always welcome. So please feel free to leave me a comment down below while you're down there. All the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. And you can also click the like button if you enjoyed this video. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options, including the coasters and beer glasses, which are finally back in stock. And subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.